a tēnā koutou katoa. Ai, ko Linda Tuhiwai Smith a uh, tōku ingoa nō Ngāti Aua, Ngāti Pro, Tū Haurangi, Woku Iwi, uh, nō reira tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak today. It's kind of daunting to have a live audience because I've been like in Zoom world <laughs> for months. And um, in, in any day, like yesterday, I was in Zoom world in Australia, Zoom world in UK, Germany, and now I'm in the real world um, in Porneke. So it's good to see real faces, not sort of framed by a box. So, um, I was asked to talk about transformational uh, change, and to and I come at that uh, kopapa uh, from a decolonising and kopapa Māori lens, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means, and along the way I'm going to throw some other thoughts out. So, firstly, there's some caveats in terms of what I talk about. So, I'm not here to talk about change management uh, or what that means, uh, but also I come really from a particular flat, uh, platform of understanding transformation. And I would say it's a big picture uh, platform. I'm a child of Ngā Tamatoa, I was a member of Ngā Tamatoa. Um, for those of you who don't know Ngā Tamatoa, you are living partly in a world that Ngā Tamatoa tried to create in terms of honouring Te Tiriti o Waitangi and revitalising our reo. So in that era, which was really the 1970s, there were these dreams that things were possible, that just because someone said our language was dead didn't mean we had to accept that, and that change was possible that we could change that. Just because someone said the treaty or the treaty was a nullity didn't mean that we had to accept that, that we could change that. I'm also a parent who happened to have a child in 1982, which is the beginning of Kohanga Reo. And so I was part of a whānau that created a Kohanga Reo. Um, it was in Auckland at the time, we would go to uh, Māori Affairs at the time and argue for $5,000 to get started. And we would be on this side of the room with our babies and on this side of the room would be social workers who are arguing for money to look after kids who are glue sniffers sleeping under bridges in Auckland. And we were asked to basically debate amongst ourselves who deserved $5,000, a piddly $5,000 to get started. And Kohanga Reo at that time was the fastest growing early childhood movement in the world. It was a rapid uptake, driven not by rules, not by government policies, not by processes, but by a kaupapa, a vision that we could save our language, that mummies and babies could save the Māori language. That's what that vision was about, or that parents, that whānau, that if we got together and we believed in our strengths, we could do something to save our language. The most practical thing we could do was live our language by immersing our babies in Te Reo Māori. And that was the vision of Kohanga Reo. It was pre the National Trust, it was pre rules, it was pre the Ministry of Education. It was a kaupapa that was driven at the community level, primarily by parents and primarily by Māori women. That's Kohanga Reo. I'm also part of the group who started Kura Kaupapa Māori I was in the, the meetings where we decided that was the term because we took immense pleasure in watching ministry or department of education bureaucrats try to say that word. <laughs> <laughs> and we wanted to see it in the legislation, kura, kaupapa, Māori. 
And we deliberately wanted that because we didn't want to be framed as bilingual schools, right? We were not a bilingual school in movement. We understood that very much in terms of all the research at the time was about French bilingual education in Canada or some other European model was not about indigenous language, it was not about an understanding the relationship between the theft of a language and colonization. Not language loss, wasn't the losing of a language, it was the taking of a language in the same way that land was taken. And so we wanted to change and reframe the debate about the medium of education and to reframe it in our terms as a kaupapa Māori initiative, not a bilingual initiative. So I come out of that as well. And then I also come out of the Wānanga movement. So this week I started at Te Whare Wānanga, Wānanga o Awani Arangi in Whakatane, which was founded essentially by my father and a couple of other old men <laughs> and an iwi who similarly believed that you could transform tertiary education so that it educates an iwi, not just about the past but for the future. So all these things that I've been a part of have given me a particular view about change, about transformation, about dreaming the impossible and striving to make it happen, about understanding intergenerational responsibilities and understanding the sort of length of time it takes to struggle for an idea and understanding what it means to play a long game, part of which is patience, part of which is impatience, part of which is about seizing opportunities, part of which is building a vision from the ground upwards. And so that's really the context that I speak about transformation. So it's not really about organisational change at a unitary level, although you know, I've been part of those changes as well in terms of um, reviewing this department and that faculty and this institution and sort of getting them into particular um, places. So I do have that sort of side of me as well. These are my two mokopuna and um, <laughs> you will see they really love having their photos taken. This was some time ago um, and I'll be using mostly whānau images uh, in this talk. All right, so this is the um, latest edition of the Decolonising Methodologies book. You know, the first one was a blue one, and everybody used to ask me, who are those women on the front cover? <laughs> um, and I used to get into trouble um, because of the images on the front cover, because when I'd travel around the world, people would expect one of those women to turn up. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I remember chasing two guys down an airport in San Diego. San Diego. The, the airport was closing. They were my last chance to be picked up. And I just happened to see the top of the book outside his back pocket. I, and I, you know, chased after him saying, are you looking for me? And he sort of looked at me and he pulled the book out. And he said, are you Linda? Yeah. You're not this woman, of course I'm not this woman, and you don't look like an Indian. Um, <laughs> I was at the end of my tether, it was like going on night time, having arrived from New Zealand. Um, so then the next book was a pink one, I think, and it had a footprint on, and the first thing my mother said is, is that your footprint? Um, no, I have no idea whose footprint it is. But um, anyway, this has just come out. Uh, I've been locked down just finishing it off and tidying it up. And I guess what it represents um, is a sort of thinking over a number of decades about the sort of decolonising um, journey that Indigenous peoples have been on. 
and what that means. So not not the necessarily just the political event of a country uh, going through uh, decolonisation after World War II, but what it means in terms of a mindset, in terms of the way we think about ourselves, in terms of the way that work is done, life is lived, um, the languaging of how we talk in a society that's on a decolonising um, journey. And so, in a sense, in this book, um, there's a range of projects that I sort of posited, which are really about research and knowledge, uh, not necessarily um, anything wider. But having said that, you know, um, it has been applied really widely. So this image is about a recent um, survey about racism that was done uh, by Te Atawhai o Te Ao, based in Wanganui, an independent research institute, and I'm on the board. And my sister-in-law, Cheryl Smith, started that institute. So some of the things that I think we have to do in thinking about our colonial past is that understand a few fundamentals. Firstly, the Māori world did not start with the arrival of Tasman or with the arrival of Cook. So when we're talking about Te Ao Māori or we're talking about Mā Tauranga, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and the accumulation of knowledge and language and insight. And if you put it in that scale, colonisation is like this in terms of our journey as a people across the vast Pacific Ocean to here. We were not a bunch of dummies, basically, who floated from island to island and landed up here by accident. It takes knowledge to do that. And it takes a certain drive, a certain attitude. Nor were we like just having so many babies on an island that we had to move because we were overpopulating it, which is one theory, that we were driven because of overpopulation. Nor did we drift here. I mean, it's really important to understand that. It's important to understand the deliberate journey that Māori took to arrive here. How do we know it's deliberate? Because women came on our waka. And in the Pacific, women generally don't go on waka if you're on a fishing expedition. In many parts of the Pacific, that's the role only of men. So to have a deliberate journey, you have men and women. You have women who are childbearing. That means young women. That's a long journey. That's a Fano journey and it's a deliberate journey that takes a lot of confidence. So that scale, I think, is really important to stretch it out, to understand for Māori that we can't just be defined by our oppression. We can't just be defined by colonialism. We can't let our minds be limited and constrained by that. It's really important to understand this bigger potential that we lived, because I think that's where I would want to set the kind of mindset we need for imagining the future. Not this, but out here. So we do have to grapple with this past of colonialism. And that's not like we can do it today. It is constantly coming up and reminding ourselves all the time um, about how powerful um, that colonial experience has been, how destructive, how traumatic, how fragmenting it has been. And we do have to come to terms with that and recognise not just what it destroyed, but also the kinds of things it also created. New things, difficult things, New, the new ways that we had to constitute ourselves, the new ways we had to organise 
the new institutions that we had to build. A kōhanga reo is a new institution. A kura is a new institution. So there's constant need to build entities and institutions within which we can flourish. And without them, we can't flourish because the institutions that used to be there have gone. And so at the same time as I think we have to grapple with that past, we also constantly have to think about futures. You know, so one of the criticisms often is that Māori are stuck in the past. We can't get over the past. Um, you know, and I just, well, I just think that's wrong. Um, we're not stuck in the past. I think we understand, we use the past to understand the future. And while I'm talking about this as this is our past and we've got to get past this to get to that to imagine the future. All right, so that's often where I think there is this tendency to be stuck. Is if you just get stuck in the trauma, if you could just get stuck in the negative, it's really hard to dream because you need hope in that space and there's no hope in it. There's hope in this space. There's hope when you cast a wider lens and you go back further in time to a world in which Māori did govern that world. Māori did exercise mana motuake. And in that world, Māori were creative. They were really creative. They were very technological. They invented technologies. Right, they're very kind of complicated human beings like what you would expect in any autonomous society. And I think that's really the past we have to get back to. Not to recreate it and live like that, but because that opens up futures. That allows us to, to imagine a future in which our mātauranga thrives again which our real thrives um, and our imaginations thrive. So I think it's also a process of dismantling particular paradigms, um, understanding issues around racism and working you know, really hard to pull those apart. And anyone who's worked in that space will tell you it's really challenging because what we're up against is not just a mindset, we've got to change public discourse, public attitudes, public education, and not just the public out there, it's the public in here and the public in here. All right, it's layers and layers of a way of thinking, knowing, being and acting that is embedded in racism, embedded in racist ideas. And we've got to move out of that but that's just one paradigm. There's a whole lot of others, and I'll talk about some of those. So I think drawing from Māori knowledge, values, and language has been really important uh, for me and those of us um, who work in the same space to see that as the platform of strength that enables us to imagine something different. All right, that's really important that we take for granted, in a sense, as natural, that we had knowledge. It's not a, it's not like a, oh, you people had knowledge kind of thing. It's like, well, of course we did. Um, and we, not only did we have knowledge before Cook arrived, or Tasman arrived, we've had knowledge, and we've been making knowledge since they arrived. Right? We didn't stop knowing when Europeans arrived. We didn't stop learning. We've continued to learn and we've continued to build our knowledge. This time it's knowledge of the crown. It's knowledge of colonialism. It's knowledge of religion. It's knowledge of change. It's knowledge of trauma. It's knowledge of being made landless. There's knowledge of negotiating with the Crown. There's a whole lot of things that we've learned. 
um, because of being forced to in some cases, but because we've also had the opportunity to think about these things and to talk about them within our own communities. I think the real deep thing about, the real challenging thing, maybe for government, for institutions definitely, is that next point of what, what does it mean to change power relations? What does it mean to shift power, to move power, to decenter power? I think that's one of the most challenging is to, you know, people kind of grapple with the idea of can you give up power? <coughs> right? Is that something you give up or is it something someone takes from you? Like they, it's not for you to give because you just inherently have it. So what, do you just give your arm part of the power or your head part of the power? Or is it for someone to take? It's kind of quite a critical idea. What does it mean to share power and to share it in genuine ways? And there are lots of words that imply this, eh? Like partnership. So that's a cool word. It implies some sort of partnering up, sharing of power. And most people sort of, their analogy for thinking about that word partnership is to think about marriage. Bad model. <laughs> Bad, don't go there. Not a good model. Not marriage in a Western paradigm sense. All right, because it's imbued with property rights. Or the, or the word I've been, I put out on Facebook the other day, the principle of coverture. <laughs> right? Coverture is a medieval doctrine that when a woman married, she became part of the husband, indivisible from the husband. So she had no rights at all. That's embedded in the concept of marriage. Um, so not a good model for thinking about partnership. We have to think about partnership in, I think, institutional ways and in collective ways, um, rather than in, you know, what it means for two individuals to join up and try and try and survive together and have babies and be nannies and cuddles and things. Um, so that shifting relations of power is probably, you know, one area that I think you would be grappling with. Um, universities are grappling with it. Other institutions in terms of setting up, whether they call it bicultural partnership, treaty partnership. So we'll come back to that shortly. So embedded in all this then is this idea of decentering whiteness, Pākehā tanga, um, colonialism, patriarchy, and heteronormativity. I mean, th those are big ideas and terms which sort of start to get at the kind of power that we're really, or relations of power that we're embedded in. That there's this idea of the sort of normative nature of whiteness, the normative nature of patriarchy and heterosexuality, that those are really powerful ideas that strike for some people at the core of a value system. Um, and anything that strikes at a value system is hard to challenge. It's very hard to kind of, even though you don't think you have the value, you do have the value when someone puts up something else. Suddenly you identify that that's a value. And then I think kind of working with different concepts uh, across the indigenous world, really, this idea of relationality is really powerful. Um, we talk about here in Aotearoa in terms of relationships, um, whanaungatanga, whakapapa, or, you know, those senses of ideas. I know in Canada, um, they use the term, all my relations, which is a term which is not just about people, but all my relations is about animals and all the other entities in the environment. So it's a philosophical or epistemological idea of humans not being the be-all 
you know, of, of the world, of planet Earth, that humans are important in it, in it, but humans need to interrelate with the world. And in Māori ideas, it means we papa to everything in the world. We descend from the Sky Father and Mother Earth. Every entity in Aotearoa has an atua from which it descends. So these are big genealogies. And basically what they say is humans are not the be-all of Earth. <coughs> they have responsibilities, but they don't have the right to exploit the Earth to nothingness. They don't have the right to destroy the Earth. Because if they're doing that, they're destroying their relations. When you destroy forests, you destroy your relations. When you upset the balance between the forest, the water, the whenua, you destroy relations and relationships. So that idea is a really powerful idea. Um, I, you know, it is in Western philosophy as well, but it's actually central uh, to Indigenous philosophy. That then links to ideas about connectedness and then this intergenerational sense of time, of being and understanding change as, as being intergenerational, not necessarily um, fast food takeaway models of change. I think, you know, another key idea is about investing in capacity building. I was just talking to someone earlier. For most of my career, I've focused on building the capacity of Māori. I've been, you know, quite explicit about that and of under other Indigenous peoples. But we're in an interesting time now where we also have to build the capacity of institutions, and that includes crown institutions who clearly don't have the capacity to do this new work with Māori, to, to understand what it means to partner with Māori. So there's a different kind of capacity building. It's not a kind which is just making sure everyone's educated and skilled. That's not necessarily the capacity that we're needing to build. It's the capacity to work in these new spaces, work with new knowledge, work with Māori ideas, work with Māori concepts, work with iwi, form different kinds of relationships um, and understand what it is to go on a journey together. Because actually in some of the space, you don't really know the long, what it's going to look like long term. You have a, you have a view, but in order to get there, you need each other to go on the journey together to get there. If one of you gets there at the end, fail. Big failure, all right? And that's the kind of nature of the journey that we're on. It's not a race. It's just not a race. It's not that kind of journey. And then I think, you know, the final point really, and really I've just summarised quite a few ideas that are in here. It's just these sort of healing processes other countries are more explicit about healing. I don't know if you saw, it would have been hard to avoid the news about the um, identifying of human remains at a residential school in British Columbia and Kamloops. It's a place I've visited. Um, my husband Graham worked over in British Columbia for a number of years. So, you know, immediately I saw the news, I thought, I know exactly how my friends and colleagues and students uh, will be feeling, just revisiting, re-traumatising them really, but also know it's been purposeful identifying remains. And it's not the only country where they're doing this work, right? So I know that they're also doing it in Ireland, um, at mothers and babies' homes, looking for the remains of babies that just disappeared. I um, also know they've been doing it in um, Latin American countries and in Spain where there's been this huge sort of disappearance of people. They've disappeared. Um, so this journey to have to go there, 
to find the remains, to get closure, people talk about it as closure, to to be satisfied that what you suspected was actually true. You know, those sorts of ideas. So in the colonial mythology is like, you should just get over all of that. The fact of the matter is these um, big traumatic events are not things that people get over with. They live intergenerationally. And I think there's people, there's a lot of lack of understanding of how the powerful impact those stories have even down the line intergenerationally. Some, you know, families have been able to bury that, but they've done it in very purposeful ways. Right? They've just tried to close the door. It's meant they've often run away, changed country, changed context, changed name, changed identity. But those who refuse to do that can't run away. It's, it's in them to find out. Um, and that sort of, that then leads to these ideas about healing processes. How do you then, understanding that, kind of go through a process of healing? And, you know, I thought about this in the um, negotiations. I was a negotiator for the Ngāti Pro settlement, representing probably the most difficult hapū in the iwi, the one that constantly did not agree with Uncle Afi Mahuika. Um, and, you know, I remember talking to um, aunties and that about, you know, what they wanted because what they wanted, they weren't going to get. We kind of knew that. Um, it didn't stop them from wanting it. But so how do you kind of reconcile? Well, you're just not going to get it. Well, A, it's gone, uh, like totally. Uh, B, it's not on the menu. you are not going to get access to that. It, even if we got it, it's not going to come back in the form that you might want. So how do we deal with that. Um, so one of the reasons I like looking at other indigenous places is that they have put more work into healing and healing ceremonies and thinking creatively about these ceremonies that you, you, you basically design them. You're not plucking them out of the past um, and trying to kind of regenerate. Did we have a ceremony for colonizers, losing our this, losing our shit, taking our shit. No, <laughs> we didn't. We have to invent it. And why shouldn't we? You know, that's the point about being, having langa tiratanga yeah. is to continually create and think about things for the new circumstances. And so healing, I think, is really important and underdone in New Zealand. It's underdone because New Zealanders are really pragmatic. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, let's just get on with it. We're going there. Come on, you're all on board. Well, no, there's going to be a group who are not on board because they're stuck. And they're stuck because we need these healing processes to go through. What do they look like? Well, I've been to some. You know, now, I'm someone who does not like sitting in a circle doing get-to-know-each-other activities. It's like, that's not me. Um, so there have to be a range of different ceremonies, right? Some of which involves karakia, clearly, but some of which involves wānanga, some of which involves kōrero, some of which involve just understanding our history, that part of that is also a healing journey. I think it does mean understanding language and learning a new language for communicating, for talking about things. Um, an alternative way to express ideas. I think language is really important for how we think about each other. In a way, I've talked about some of these ideas here, and they're just four um, that I think are important because the other thing I hear a lot in our community is like the term, oh, just get real. Well, I'm someone who likes to ask, well, what is real? What is reality? 
because reality is framed by language and discourse, philosophies, ideas, um, common sense often. And a lot of what we have to do is reframe that. That's what we did in Kohanga Reo, is you just reframe what the challenge is and think about doing it in a new way. It just opens up different ways of seeing and different possibilities. The reclaiming thing is not just about claiming, um, you know, physical material things, like repatriating Tonga from museums or something, or reclaiming land and treaty settlements. I think it's also about reclaiming important ideas about who we want to be and who we are. Um, reclaiming the, these kind of a diversity of identities. Um, reclaiming imagination, reclaiming knowledge, reclaiming a past, that those are important. It's important to write. I mean, I've always thought it's important to write, um, to write these things down and to think about, you know, in writing, what does it mean to write in decolonial ways? Because I can tell you it's really hard. Our language, our English language, is very much framed in a particular way of writing, of understanding the world. And it's hard to get away from that. There's a hierarchy, there are classification systems, there are categories that we use that are taken for granted. And in that then, I think, is this, how do you write the world? How do you write our position? How do you write our identity? And, and a consciousness about that. So Graham Smith, that's my husband, he's there with the two mokos. Um, he talks a lot about praxis. It's an idea also that Paulo Freire, who's a Brazilian educator, um, also, well, who kind of began this idea. And I think in the Freirean sense and the way Graham talks about it, it's that sort of conscientization or consciousness, um, action, theory, reflection, that it's a cycle of change. Um, I've just kind of broken those down into four, four ideas around thinking and theorizing. I don't see theorizing as um, necessarily just an elite academic exercise. I think all of you theorise, everyone theorises, it's how we make sense of what is real. Uh, it, is, it is how our view of reality is actually reinforced by theorising. Uh, but ultimately it's about thinking quite deeply, and then about acting and changing and doing the things, um, if you like, implementing our, our ideas reflecting and evaluating them, and then using that reflection to refine, re-examine, think, theorise, and carry on. And I think organisations have to embed that as a, as, a, um, as a culture, especially knowledge institutions, because in knowledge institutions, and I, I see Oranga Tamariki, you know, Crown agencies, are knowledge institutions in similar ways to universities and similar ways to museums. You work from a, from a base of knowledge. You produce knowledge, you reproduce knowledge, you practice knowledge, you learn new knowledge. You know, you're in the business of knowledge, which means you're also in the business of learning. And learning <coughs> institutions have to actively learn, not, um, get stuck in concrete and stop learning. So that cycle's important for us as individuals, but it's also important for us as collectives. And, and embedding it kind of in practice, I think is really important. Right, so this in the middle was a kind of haphazard reunion of Ngā Tamatoa that we held in Hamilton few years back and we're in the business of organising our, what we think is our 50-something um, anniversary this year. Um, and, you know, my, my basic message is who, who says can't change, change can't happen? 
All right, if, if we lived with this belief that change can't happen, that you can't dream a dream and make it happen, then you just you may as well die, really. Because the humans, humans believe in change. Humans are equipped to change. And um, I think in our world, shifting from the sense of being stuck in oppression, if you like, and believing that in order to change, you had to act, you had to challenge the status quo, not just of government, not just of Pākehā society, but of our own communities, was very powerful. All right, so some of our biggest enemies when we were in Ngā Tamatoa were our own people. All right, um, they thought we were disrespectful, which we were, um, which we had to be, which we knew consciously that we had to push even our own people out of their um, victimhood mode because we just thought that was a trap. But at the same time, as we're all getting old and we're getting forgetful. And so our children are organising this reunion. And then they're asking us for things like, when did you like start? And we're like, oh, I think it was at a hui. It's, uh, you know, like, I've got a version, so that person's got a version. And it's like, and when did you do this? And we're thinking, oh, what event was that? You know, what were you at Waitangi? And, you know, so this was not an era where, where there were cell phones, where you could take photos of yourself, where there was this documentary record in moment by moment of what you did. This was pre all of that. This was Polaroid camera day, right? We had Polaroid photos, which didn't last very long. Um, in other words, there's no consciousness of documenting, in a sense, what we were doing. And so we're trying to build it out of bits and pieces of broken memories. Um, and three quarters of our group have died, have passed on. So it's, you know, it's an interesting journey. But I think what I want to really go back to, and we were just one group in that era of many. There, there were many interesting, you know, anti-war groups. There were um, feminist groups, gay liberation groups, you name it. Um, socials were fabulous uh, when we were at university. It was just <laughs> the diversity of political viewpoints was really good. Um, but the struggle for our real has not gone away, right? It's taken into new places, but it would not be where it is now if it weren't for the intervention of a generation who did not speak to real, mm -hmm. who understood immediately what that meant mm -hmm. to, to know that your parents spoke the real, but you didn't, mm -hmm. and to see the consequences of that and to try and avert that, to do something to avert it. You know, and that is essentially <laughs> a political act that was about you know, why that happened, the, the language, um, the death of our language, but also to understand that for a language to live, it had to be spoken by real people. And, um, and then how do you make that happen? So there are these two things that go on, and in a way they represent the decolonizing and the kaupapa Māori relationship, is you're, you're kind of reaching out to wider society, to the world, to government, um, that these, this change has to be supported. You have to stop doing these things. You have to support doing these things, but also to work in our own world, to say, you've got to believe that our real has value. You've got to believe that our ideas have value. You've got to re-believe that, and you've got to make it happen, because this side can't do it all by itself. All right, you we have to do it too. So that's why that journey is important, and that's why the relationship is important. So once again, this is like a synthesis of a whole lot of ideas into just a few bullet points. 
And, and I've emphasised some, you know, which is really around value in our identity. Now, you, you might think, oh, well, you know, all Māoris value their identity now. Well, they do now, but they didn't in 1970. And, and they, you know, I grew up with people who honestly worked hard to be Pākehā. And you might, I mean, there's a point you can look at it and it's ridiculous. Like, because they're brown. You think, how, you, how can you pretend to be a Pākehā and you're brown? You know, I remember talking to a kind of a cousin of mine and a delicatessen in Auckland and we turned up and go, hey, cuz. And she said, I'm working here. You know, like, don't bother me. And then she said something to us like, would you like some pate? And we're like, what the hell? You know, well, we didn't really say what the hell in those days, but um, why, why are you working so hard to pretend you don't know us? Because that, that's, that's a very cognitively violent thing to do, is to disappear an identity. But there was a generation in the 50s and the 60s who did that. Um, you know, who actively bought into the assimilation agenda and genuinely believed that they could assimilate. And I, in my family, we've got lots of stories um, about people trying to do that, which of course we always thought was funny wasn't really funny for them, but we always thought it's like ridiculous. And it's the power of hegemony, hegemony, the concept of hegemony, that a brown person can look in a mirror and see a white person looking back, which is what some people psychologically see. And for those of you who know the term hegemony, it's a good example of how hegemony works. It's that you don't see yourself, you see this other image. Um, seeing the strength, this is a real challenge in some cases. It's getting easier now to see strength in these constructs. Um, it's hard to see strength when all you see is something broken and damaged. You know, when you look at something broken and damaged, you think there's no strength how come there's no strength in this it's destroyed so it takes a lot of courage to see through the brokenness through the damage to the core of a beauty that's potentially there to see strength to see beauty to see this amazing ancestry to see tipuna who created heaven and earth or sky and earth, you know, to, to see in a damaged person this world that's beautiful or to see in a damaged context. And yet a lot of what we've had to do to rebuild ourselves is to see strength in ourselves. And to do that takes love, takes courage, takes hard work, it takes patience, takes commitment, takes energy, and it takes guts, <coughs> all right? Because it's easier to do the opposite. It's easier to turn away than to invest in that work. So it's really important to recognise the potential of those structures, but also the potential to mediate a lot of the other things that are happening. You know, I see that a lot and I've experienced, you know, through, throughout my life, some of the most generous people are often the most impoverished. All right, they're most generous with their spirit, generous with the food that they have in their cupboard. Um, and that's how I grew up. I grew up in families who, when Manuhiri came, the best food in the cupboard. And literally we did, we had cupboards, not fridges or meat lockers, we had meat lockers, but our best food was always given to visitors. Even if it meant there was no food left, or well, you just had bread and jam the next day. Um, always this generosity of spirit, it's really powerful. I think also understanding 
why Māori engagement and agency so important. It's not just about engaging Māori in whatever the issue is. It's having them have a sense of agency in that engagement. All right, there's no point in them coming to a hui, sitting around the room, and because we're all good at doing this, we sit around the room, we smile, and we're like, you know, like we've got these um, invisible mind-connecting strategies where we know what everyone in the room is thinking without even communicating, <laughs> all right? And we know that they're thinking, shit, what's this? one more consultation, you know, or that's what one of the aunties and another one is going, oh, here we go again, but one of us has to stay in the room. Um, <laughs> so we kind of understand, you know, well, I go to lots of those kind of hui. <laughs> and you just sit there and you think, okay, but yes, this is important, this process is important, it's important for us to be in the room, but I'm not really in it. You know, because you haven't turned me on. You haven't flicked that it. I have a sense of agency switch. You haven't inspired it. You haven't reached it. You haven't sort of penetrated all these other barriers going on. So engaging the agency of Māori to participate, that's, that's what's hard, not having a hui with Māori. Most of you can probably organise a hui with Māori. Engaging Māori is much deeper. And then the final point is really the sort of shifting away and really examining things for the sort of implicit deficit approach that's embedded in it, an implicit blame culture that comes with that. So this is uh, Robin Kahukiwa which I bought for myself, and then I got shamed in giving it to my daughter <laughs> for Christmas to give her something really beautiful. Um, so just four ideas then. Being Māori is normal, okay? And I say that as a just taken for, for granted thing, because I certainly grew up in a world where being Māori in Aotearoa was to be different, to be the other. And I think we're still partly in that world. Our language, knowledge, culture is valid, legitimate. Actually, it's awesome. It's beautiful, our language, knowledge and culture. It's what makes you and us unique in this country. It comes from here. We can design and lead our own solutions. And man, we can do that. Kohangaru is a great example. It's not saying it comes purely from us, but we're really good at adapting other ideas and putting them together, and suddenly we have what's called kōhanga reo, which is a nest of language. You know, that concept that brings it together is, is what we're also good at. And mm. our collective ways of working are a strength. They often require patience, uh, because they require communication. And with communication across a collective, that can be time consuming. But what we learn in, in our ways of doing things is if you don't communicate, you're in trouble. If you don't operate collectively, things can fail, right? Not because some people are anti the idea, but because the bit of the idea they got third party meant they went off in that direction, not this direction. So it is a collective way of working, it is a way of working. Um, and for those of us growing up in this way, you know, it's kind of second nature and intuitive, but to learn to work in this way, I think is much more challenging. So Graham talks about this praxis cycle, which comes out of the Freireian model as well, around consciousness raising, action, reflection, and I've just sort of turned this into a kaupapa Māori sort of idea, where whānau really are at the centre. But when I say whānau, there are different concepts of whānau. So every, every time the crown takes one of our words, then it creates a whole different concept. 
All right, so when the Crown uses the word whānau, and I, there's a specific document that used whānau um, in education, it was the Tomorrow Schools. The Tomorrow Schools policy was the first time, I think, in education that we saw this word, but it was so devoid of what we meant by whānau that it became kind of meaningless. It was just a word plopped into the middle of a sentence that stripped away its actual meaning. Um, so words are also relational, all right? They live in relation to or exist in relation to other ideas. And so that borrowing bits and pieces of Māori language, um, I just, it irritates me um, because I think it needs to be more thoughtful used carefully, it's not, these aren't translations of things, they're quite deep concepts. So Fano at one level is one of our deepest institutional ideas, a social institution, all right? So it's, you can't get smaller than that. You, we have these other relationships like tuakana teina, um, you know, uh, tāne wahine, you can get those sort of relationships, but they're not really a, a, an institution in a social sense of um, lots of people who do things together. Fano is the smallest unit, I think, of what you might call a, a deeply Māori institution that survived over time. It's got very strong principles that keep it together. You know, then you have other institutions that might build from that until you get iwi, which is a completely different institution to maybe the idea of whānau. And remember, the word whānau is linked to birth. And then when you get into birth, you get into whenua, which is linked to afterbirth. Right, so our concepts are really amazing and they're very interconnected but they're the driving force then of what change for us means um, so I think all these things are really important in this cycle of how we think about things but also how we think ultimately about transformation because if it doesn't do anything transformational at the whānau level it doesn't change nothing changes so I think that's it. Um, you know, what I'd leave, and I have these small mokupunas, same mokupunas, <laughs> they're just littler, because I'd be really embarrassed if I showed them now. Um, the other thing to remember is we don't look alike anymore. One of the unique things in New Zealand is you can't use colour to determine who's Māori. Yeah. Right, so issues around colour for for us just don't make sense. We have blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Māori-speaking Māori, all right? Um, the colour range in one whānau, you know, I know in my mother's whānau, we've got green eyes, uh, blue eyes, brown eyes, black eyes, dark skin, middle-coloured skin, white skin, all in one whānau. And it's kind of, so it's really important, you know, when people are talking about issues of race and racism, that for us, colour is not the, is not the issue, all right? The kind of racism that we, is about our culture, it's about our language, it's about the collective of our people and our history in that. There is the casual racism, that's associated with how individuals are treated. All my friends who have moko kauai, you know, are just constantly offended and insulted by the way people think they can go up and touch them and, or, you know, say outrageous things to them. That sort of casual racism um, clearly exists in New Zealand and has been given permission to thrive. Um, but, you know, a lot of the systemic issues that we have to deal with are, are very nuanced to our circumstance here. Very subtle. I think when you're reading international literature, you do have to bring them back to Aotearoa, to our specific context. 
And in the end, our solutions come out of our context. Can't import a program from Minnesota, you know, to here and expect it to work. Because that's not how things work here. You know, it comes back to the sense of agency and engagement, connection, all those sorts of things. So thank you very much. Kapai, that's it from me. <laughs>